gentleman is Tom McMillan, uh, Chief uh, War Officer Four. Four. United retired. State, retired. Um, one tour, first tour in, in Vietnam as an infantry platoon commander. Went back to Vietnam as a Chinook helicopter pilot. Rare, rare combination of duty to country, and he very able, to, uh, ably and capably uh, shares uh, much information with any audience with whom he speaks. Tom. Thank you. <clears throat> the first thing I want to mention, Gary spun the rotor blade and went wop, wop, wop. <laughs> that is a product of the main rotor blade going over the tail boom. It's a sonic boom that's created when the main rotor, boom go, rotor he, the blade goes over the tail boom. In subsequent helicopters, you don't have that noise because they lowered the tail boom and raised it again and minimized that noise. I mean, anywhere you are, whether it's in uh, Otsego County or in Vietnam, you knew a Huey was coming at you because of that wop, wop, wop sound. So technology just, they, the engineers created a better way to minimize that sound. I'm going to step, we're talking about the 60s, and I have to bring in this is a history lecture to get started. Morris, New York, was named after Jacob Morris. He was a general for, or he was a general and an aide to Washington during the Revolution. His father was Lewis Morris, who uh, was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Lewis Morris' brother was Governor Morris, and he was he was involved in writing the American Constitution. Uh, they lived in what they called Mauriciana, which is Yonkers in the Bronx area today. <clears throat> in the Constitution, they wrote it uh, as a perfect document for democracy. In it, it said, if a person disagrees with a government policy, you have the right to d disagree. And so today, not only are we going to talk about Vietnam, but I brought my sister here who was a protester during the Vietnam War. She had every right to do it peaceably, and she did it in the sit-ins and all the other activities that w involved the neg saying, I don't think we should be there. And it's important that they be acknowledged, too, because it's all part of that era. I, went, I finished high school in 1962. I went to Texas A&M as a 17-year-old boy and wasted five semesters of my parents' money. However, Texas A&M in 1962 was a military academy. I learned how to polish boots, wear a military uniform, have a clean, presentable room for inspection. So when I joined the Army in 1966, I already knew it. It was easy. I didn't have to adjust from a civilian lifestyle. So I went to basic training, advanced individual training, officer candidate school, and in August of 1967, I found myself in Vietnam with an infantry platoon. 25 soldiers who I never met before in my life. And they're looking at this butter bar, this lieutenant. Who's this guy? What does he know? He knew nothing. But in the course of maybe two weeks, a month, I, was, I understood and I learned the job that I had to do. I think you'll see in some of those books. We walked, the area that I worked in was Military Region 3, which was north and west of Saigon. It was primarily rice paddies, triple canopy jungle, and rubber tree plantations. And we would walk single file Indian style through these areas looking for evidence. It was called, a, initially it was called search and destroy, but we had to refine that and make it more acceptable, so we called it a reconnaissance in force. So in the course of three months, I was on the receiving end of lead poisoning three times. People were shooting at me saying, we didn't, we didn't want you there. I never was wounded, never my soldiers were wounded. This badge is a combat infantryman's badge. This is the most exalted badge in the United States Army because we were in combat and we're receiving fire. One of the, uh, walking through streams chest deep and we would hold our weapon and ammunition above our heads so as to not get them wet. And one time my map was in this pocket down here and it floated to the surface and went downstream I had to go get it. One time the current was so stiff 
that I put my hand up on a tree to stop my downstream sail and the tree was like a large rose bush or a locust tree and it cut my hand because of all the spines. Rubber tree plantations were interesting also because you would spread out laterally but still heading in one direction and every time and a rubber tree plantation is like an apple orchard. It's just spaced equally all the way along and uh, what they would do is cut a semicircle around the tree and with a nail at the bottom of this cut and a small porcelain cup and the rubber sap would drip into that, it was white, and the Vietnamese women would walk along with a yoke over their shoulder and a pail on either side and take the liquid from that cup and dump it into a pail and eventually go to a truck and haul it off. But every time we walked between two rubber trees, because we were spread out, you would go like this because you're wiping the spider webs off your face. <laughs> And the spiders were as big as my hand. So that, and then the other area was, of course, rice paddies that were either flooded during the growing season or dry during the harvest season, and water buffalo. So that was my first tour. And North Vietnamese, you could tell a North Vietnamese person because they chewed betel nut and their teeth were all black. The barber in the base camp was from the North Vietnam, but he was a friendly, decent man, an older man, but every time he would shave, cut my hair, he would shave with a straight razor right underneath my eyes. Which means if he was vicious, he could have flicked my eye out in no time at all. But he was a decent person. And we had Vietnamese workers come into our base camp to clean the place. And this is a little crude. We had what was called shit burners. We are, latrines are just like you go in a campground. There were latrine, there were buildings out outside, and underneath would be a, a third of a 55-gallon drum. And every morning, this shit burner would come into the company area, pull that can out, pour diesel fuel in it, and light it, and that's how we rid ourselves of the human waste. So those are kind of interesting experiences that we had. Then, after a completed year, I went to helicopter flight school, and I've, I've mentioned to a lot of people that I'm afraid of heights. You're not going to get me on the roof of this building or at my sister's house. I'm not going to do it. So I had to co overcome that fear of, of heights to be a helicopter pilot, and it was difficult. I was the last one to solo, and they tried to... I got in with another instructor pilot, and he had actually tried to scare me. And I had to act calm, even though I wasn't. <laughs> but I progressed through the program, and then I got a transition into this aircraft. This is a Chinook helicopter made by Boeing Vertol, the same Boeing that makes airplanes, but their factory is in Philadelphia. This aircraft is 100 feet long, blade tip to blade tip. Max gross weight of a D model that I flew in the National Guard was 50,000 pounds. The aircraft weight and payload, they could pick up 25 tons. So it was a pretty impressive aircraft, and they're still used today, and the F model is all modern. So this is what I flew my second tour in Vietnam, and our primary mission was external sling loads, and I think I have a picture here. Yeah. This, the, this picture is a National Guard magazine, and they're moving a uh, howitzer, an artillery piece, and this is what our primary mission was. Not necessarily artillery all the time, ammunition, water, food, whatever a person wanted, we would deliver it. And I kind of get choked up about this, but I'm a member of the Vietnam Helicopter Pilots Association. And it's a convention of overweight, gray-haired, balding men who have inflated the war stories way out of proportion. But the banner that spans the hotel where we meet annually says, above the best, we are, the, regardless of what type of air aircraft, we're there to support that soldier on the ground. He asked for air aviation support, and we're going to give it to him. And so it's a proud organization, and the mission we flew in Vietnam and in the National Guard is that kind of pride that comes into it. Uh, I show this one. As a National Guard helicopter pilot, I flew 
these sky cranes. And the National Guard was kind of an interesting event in the 90s because government agencies would pay us to do a lift. This sky crane helicopter is over the um, Mount Rushmore. The tools to carve the heads were discarded between the heads and so the helicopter with a center cargo hook on 100 feet of cable would go down in there and a guy down the ground would load a bag of the tools and it was taken to the museum. This is a sky crane helicopter made by Sikorsky in New Haven, Connecticut, of which I was qualified in also. I'm going to... The, one of the most difficult jobs I ever had to do, the most difficult 10 minutes of my life, my first tour in Vietnam, the infantry lieutenant of the second platoon was killed in an, in an enemy action event and his body was taken back to Lai K where I was the unit executive officer and Graves registration is a military requirement. You have to positively identify the body. So I went to the morgue, which is just a steel building, with a steel table and a body bag on the steel table. And the mortician, who handles that like I handled that magazine, unzipped the bag, turned his head this way, and said, is that him? And I said, yes, it is. It was quiet. It was uncomfortable. And it probably as a result, I don't particularly like to go to funerals anymore because of that struggle that I experienced then. So it, it, <clears throat> I think one of the, pro I just came across another good uh, memory. My second tour in the airplane from Guam to Saigon, I couldn't wait to get there. I knew that it wasn't as awful as we were expected it to. The reason it's awful is because the only thing we heard about Vietnam was what we saw on Walter Cronkite in the CBS Evening News. The news per portrayed only the violence because they were charging the commercial people more money if they had a better rating. But it didn't talk at all about the humanitarian effort that went, went along with everything in Vietnam. Anyhow, my second flight, I couldn't wait to get there. My first flight, I was scared I had no idea what I was getting into. Well, on that second flight, I looked back, about three rows back on, this, on the uh, other aisle of the airplane, there was a first lieutenant who looked like I did my first tour. And I'll regret to my grave not going back, sitting next to him and saying, it's going to be all right, because I already knew it was going to be all right, because I'd already been there before. I'm going to conclude and then we can take question and answers. I do this at every lecture. I'm going to conclude by giving you <coughs> the before takeoff check for a Chinook helicopter. I'm going to uh, use every step, explain it, and then run it through, and that'll conclude my lecture. 100%, these are the two pilots up front. 100% means the rotor RPM of both rotors are going at 100%, and there's a gauge in the cockpit that reads that. Needles are joined means that both number one and number two engine are performing equally and a non-flying pilot adjusts the engine beep trim switches to make sure both needles for both engines are on top of each other, they're both performing equally. Uh, engine and transmission instruments are all in the normal operating range. Two engines, five transmissions, and three hydraulic gauges and the gauges, we want to make sure they read, they're all performing equally. And if they are, our cross check is easy because all the gauges, the green arc is all the needles are pointing to the left. So it's a quick cross check. Then 7,000 pounds of fuel. The fuel are in these pods on either side and they're graduated in pounds instead of gallons. So we always know how much the aircraft weighs when we pick it, pick it up. Uh, the parking brakes released. The, uh, all four wheels have parking brakes. We want to make sure they're released before we take off. The aft wheel swivels are locked. The aircraft steers like a forklift in a warehouse. And before takeoff, we want to make sure the locking device is locking these both in a trail position. And finally, and the most important one of all, is ready in the rear. I'm asking the flight engineer in the back here, is everything look okay for picking up off the ground? And the flight engineer will say, yes, you're clear to come up. The flight engineer owns the helicopter. The pilots up front just borrow that tail number for the day. So whether it's turning in flight, 
starting an engine or uh, on a descent, whatever maneuver we're doing, we ask the flight engineer if it's safe to do it before we do it. So, 100%, needles are joined, engine and transmission instruments are all in the normal operating range, 7,000 pounds of fuel, the parking <coughs> brakes are released, the aft wheel swivels are locked, ready in the rear. Now, he says ready in the rear. So all you do is you bring in two inches of aft cyclic, pull in a little bit of thrust, and the aircraft breaks the ground and we're on our way. End of lecture. <laughs> now, what's that? Oh, thank you. I forgot about one story. May 3rd of 1971. And Bonnie, I'm going to mention your request also, I forgot. May 3rd, 1971, I was flying on the Chinook and um, our mission sheets were, and I, I mentioned this yesterday and everybody agrees, we didn't have uh, copy machines, we had carbon paper p pages behind each the original. And so we had a copy of that and each line would represent a frequency, call sign, pickup zone and landing zone of a customer who wanted something delivered. So we would call in every line, line one complete, line two complete. At the end of the day, I would say, line, we're mission complete, we're coming in. The operations officer, John Harbor, who's a dear friend of mine in Nashville, said, so I called in, I said, we're coming in, mission complete. He said, wait a minute, I got an add-on for you. We're tired, we've flown all day, and it's an important point. Generally, aviation today is safe because of fatigue. Most Commercial pilots don't log more than 350 hours a year. I logged 972 hours in that year. We were there to support that guy on the ground. So I called back, and said, all right, wait a minute. So I took my grease pencil out of my shirt pocket. We didn't have kneeboards at the time. We would write the frequency call sign, LZ and PZ, on the window. And when I was ready, I called John. I said, okay, send me the information. He said, the LZ is Tucson, Arizona, it's a seven pound baby girl. That's how I found out my daughter was born. <laughs> when I commanded a Chinook company after Vietnam at Fort Campbell in Kentucky, which is the 101st where Neil Riddell is, uh, we told our soldiers, this is 1972, we told our soldiers, do not wear your uniform off post. Get changed into civilian clothes because we were spit on, we weren't welcome, we, they, no one liked us. They were blaming the wrong people. They were blaming the soldier instead of the politicians who sent us there. And so when people come up to me, and in, last night there were a few people didn't, today there were a few people, come up and shake my hand and say thank you for your service. That is meaningful because we, that wasn't the reception we got 50 years ago. And so that's important. End of that lecture. <laughs>